This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University, and today I want to talk about how the Fed might actually blow things up. In order to do this, we have to understand something called the Fed funds rate. This is just the interest rate that commercial banks borrow and lend their excess reserves to each other overnight. So this is a very short-term interest rate that's basically set by the Federal Federal Reserve, which is the central bank in the U.S. And the Fed basically targets a range for the Fed funds rate. Right now, that targeted range is somewhere between 0 and 0.25%, uh, 25 basis points. The Fed targets this range by doing open market operations and jawboning, saying what they're going to do. We can see that over the years, this is a chart of federal funds, uh, Fed funds rate, and how it's just had a series of higher of lower highs and lower lows. Every time the Fed has tried to raise rates, they've ended up blowing blowing something up. They did this in the late 90s. They blew up the stock market. When they raised rates in the early 2000s, from 2005 to 2007, they ended up blowing up the housing market and causing the great financial crisis. And as a result, as the economy becomes more levered, as there's more debt in the system, each time the Fed has trouble raising rates higher. So back in the early 2000s, they were able to raise Fed funds above 5%. The last time around, they couldn't even get to 2.5% without causing a large economic uh, economic slowdown. So Fed funds rate is this really short-term interest rate. What we're looking at here is the Treasury yield curve. We have one-month T-bills, we have six-month T-bills, we have 10-year notes, and 30-year, uh, the long bond. This is the date down here, so we can see the, the yield curve is basically very close to zero at the front end, and then it goes out to about 2% at the long end. And you could imagine uh, my drawing this as, as a curve. This is why it's called the yield curve. It's, it's slowly upsloping, as we can see right now. And then Fed funds is right at the front of the curve here. Before I go on, go on I just ask you, if you're finding this video helpful so far, to hit that subscribe and like button and maybe share this video with a few friends. So now that we understand the yield curve, we understand what Fed funds rate is, we can see what various banks are calling for the Fed to do this year and early next year. So for example, JP Morgan thinks the Fed's gonna hike five times this year and then three times next year. Each hike is a quarter of a point or 25 basis points as we said. And so one hike would move the range from 0 to 0.25% from 0.2 uh, up to 0.25% uh, to 0.5% each hike. And then we have Bank of America here saying they're going to be uh, 11, 11 interest rate hikes of a quarter of a point. So Bank of America, they're the most aggressive. They see the ultimate Fed funds rate getting to up to 2.75% to 3%. And then the other banks are somewhere around there. Now I want to do a thought experiment and say what would happen if Bank of America is correct and we get up to Fed funds of about 3%. Well, this would have devastating effects on the economy as I want to show you. First of all, here we have federal debt. So this is all the treasuries outstanding. This is total public debt all the way from T-bills to the long bond. And these interest rates are really set by the floor rate, which is the Fed funds rate. And then the further out you go, the interest rate gets a little bit higher is how it normally works. But this is the absolute levels of debt here. We're currently at $28.4 trillion worth of debt. And you can see how the debt just went vertical in 2020 and shows no signs, uh, no signs, signs of stopping. So let's assume a flat yield curve. And again, by a flat yield curve, I would mean something like this, where we have the interest rates the same for all the different maturities. Right now, as we said, they're upward sloping. Let's make the data really simple here and assume a flat yield curve at 3%. So the Fed funds is at 3%, the five-year note's at 3%, the 10-year note and the long bond, they're all at 3%. The yield curve is completely flat, which means that the government pays the same borrowing costs no matter what maturity it borrows. At this, we can do a, at this point, we can do just a little simple math and say if you're paying 3%, if this is your interest rate, you can pretend this is a household uh, credit card debt or a mortgage or something, and you owe uh, 28 trillion, 28.4 trillion, your interest payments, your annual interest payments would be 852 billion. So this is assuming that we get to 3% as Bank of America thinks on, on Fed funds and that that affects the whole yield curve at the same level. What, what usually happens, in fact, though, is that the yield curve remains at least slight, slightly upward sloping. So that would mean if Fed funds is at 3%, 
the 10 year note, the long bond probably are closer to four or 5%. So I did a couple other calculations here. These all assume that the, that the, that the yield curve is flat, but um, you could have it, you could have it upward sloping. If it's flat at 4%, interest payments are gonna be 1.1 trillion. If it's flat at 5%, interest payments are gonna be 1.4 trillion. Now the other thing these these numbers don't don't uh, the other thing these numbers do assume is that the total amount of government debt does not continue to grow. This is of course unlikely because we have all these the U.S. government has all these off balance sheet liabilities. This is money that is promised has been promised to retirees and will indeed be paid out. Uh, things like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and so this this total uh, public debt here does not take into account those off balance sheet things. But they will come on balance sheet as they become due, and they'll become come on as potential expenses, or I would should say required expenses, because they will indeed be paid. You can't not pay out money to retirees, or you'll cause you'll cause riots. And and uh, old people uh, tend to vote more than young people. These are str very strong. Uh, basically, any politician that tried to do this would be voted out of office. So we can assume, and it's the right thing to do to pay the money that people have been promised in the retirement and not, not cut them off. As I said, though, it's, it's more likely that the yield curve is upward sloping. So the, the combined interest rate is maybe some, somewhere between these numbers, somewhere between $850 billion and $1.4 trillion because you have the front end at 3% and the, the back end at 5%. The government, of course, can decide where to borrow. In the recent past, they've been borrowing mostly at the front end of the curve, which is why I sort of uh, anchored these to the front end of the curve and Fed funds rate. Fed funds at 3%, as I said, probably means 10-year notes are higher and the long bonds higher. And uh, so you do you would end up with this upward sloping yield curve. If you get a, a downward sloping yield curve, that means you're about to have a recession and the Fed, the Fed would be forced to stop at that point. Now to put these numbers in perspective, 850 billion to 1.4 trillion, right now interest payments are only, quote unquote, only 424 billion. And it's it's quite extraordinary the way we throw around numbers like a billion and a trillion. If you ever try to assemble that many pieces of rice uh, or draw that many circles, you'll you'll understand uh, what giant numbers they are. We can see here in the U.S. debt clock, we can take a look and see that the interest on the debt right now, as I said, is about 424 uh, billion. And raising interest rates, raising Fed funds would get it up to as high as 1.4 trillion or even higher if the front end is at 5%, the back end could be, the long end could be at, at, at 7%. So what else happens when you raise Fed funds? When you and by by raising Fed funds, you sort of force all the interest rates up. It, it raises the interest rate on your car payment. It makes mortgage rates go up. It makes uh, credit card uh, rates go up, etc. But what else happens when you raise interest rates and constrain the borrowing cost? What happens is that assets, which are priced using discount cash flow modeling, which is really all assets have this inherent discount rate they go down. Asset prices go down when interest rates go up. Bonds go down, as we know. The prices of bonds go down. Stocks go down. This is what we've been seeing as the Fed has been pursuing tighter policy and talking about raising interest rates. For the Fed, talking is doing as they jawbone rates higher and saying we're, saying we're going to raise rates. The market begins to price that in. And we've seen higher interest rates means lower stock prices. And ultimately, if this continues too long, it means lower housing prices as well, at least temporarily. What this means is that tax receipts go down, the government revenue, the government's revenues go down because people have fewer profits in the housing market and stock market. There, there no, you don't have profits in a in a bear market for the most part. Most people don't short; they just uh, go long, and so people end up paying less in capital gains taxes, which is really a large percentage of government revenues. We can see here that federal tax revenues, money brought in, is about four trillion for the past. 12 months. So you have this combination of lower tax revenue for the government and higher expenses. The higher expenses we talked about in terms of servicing the debt where it goes from 4 uh, 424 billion as high as 1.4 trillion. So you have more than a doubling, uh, more than a doubling or a tripling. If your revenue goes down and you still need to pay all of your expenses and we've established that the US it can't default on retirees. It can't not pay interest on its debt. That would be a debt default. It can't stop spending money on, on defense when there's, there's a new Cold War happening between the US and Russia and the US and China. The government needs to keep paying all of its, its expenses. 
And as such, if the revenue goes down, it's going to need to borrow more money to make up the difference, just like a household. If your income is it falls, but you still have to meet certain expenses, you're probably going to go into debt. And the government does this as well. When the government borrows money, it increases the, the total public debt, the total federal debt, which we saw in this chart. Now, foreign buyers have stopped buying treasuries over the past few years. Central banks have stopped adding to it. Russia, for example, is choosing to buy gold instead of buy U.S. treasuries for obvious reasons. If you know you can be sanctioned, you don't want to hold a lot of a country's securities. China has not been increasing their debt load, uh, their, their holdings of U.S. treasuries um, at the margins either for the past five years. So we have this problem where we don't have enough buyers of our debt, and this is why the Fed has had to step in as the buyer of last resort in order to, to, to mop up this debt and keep interest rates low. But if the government has this revenue shortfall because asset prices have fallen, it means lower revenue, which means the government's going to have to borrow more money. More debt means the public debt goes up, and then you're on your, your way to a true debt crisis. And what will happen is the market will see this coming and will we'll, 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 uh, call the Fed's hand before it happens. This will start to get priced in. Rather than default, the Fed will just have to print up more money to buy up this new federal debt that's being issued. But then you have a situation that is really just plain silly, where the Fed raised interest rates, they pursued tighter policy, they raised Fed funds, but now they're having to print money to buy up new debt because tax revenues have fallen so much and the government's not bringing in enough money. So with their left hand, they have tighter policy. With their right hand, they have looser policy. And the Fed is basically fighting itself at that point, which it will never, it will never do. Uh, it, can't, it can't be pursuing contradictory aims in its public policy. It's actually just much easier for the Fed never to hike Fed funds this high. And the market will let the Fed know. As we've been seeing, the market's been selling off sharply and making the Federal Reserve folks panic, as I can imagine. So I would say that this Wall Street consensus is wrong. Bank of America is wrong. All of these analysts are wrong. There's no way we get to 3% Fed funds rate without massively blowing up the bond market or stock market first. You can see the damage that's happened and uh, we actually haven't even had a real rate increase. It's been priced in into the forward market, uh, but we haven't even seen it happen. So I would still say that the default setting for this decade, and Bank of America is wrong about this, the default setting is very low interest rates, probably interest rates close to zero. We have to keep real rates negative and lots of central bank money printing. And so I think we'll continue to see a lot of volatility around this, that the actual trend will be towards more money printing and low interest rates. But we have these political pressures on the Fed, especially ahead of midterms, to show that they're being tough on inflation. I would say that uh, the people who think that the Fed's trying to blow up the stock market and restore more normal valuations, I don't think that's what they're doing at all. I think they like the stock market always going up. It makes everyone happy. But there are political pressures to fight inflation, or at least to give the appearance of fighting inflation. And so we have this: uh, the Fed as this drunken sailor stumbling from one side of the boat to the other from the side of, of high inflation, 7% CPI or higher, as we've seen in the last year, to deflationary effects. Right now we're in, a, in, I wouldn't call it a deflationary period because consumer prices are not going down, but we have this situation where the US dollar is strengthening and all the asset prices are selling off, everything's selling off, stocks and bonds, et cetera. And this has a deflationary effect on the economy. It rapidly cools the economy. It slows down tax receipts. And so we have a Fed that is, is the drunken sailor Fed. It has to flail around. It has to act tough on inflation. And then when things start to blow up and the wheels start to come off the economy, it has to cut interest rates and start printing money again. And this is what happens when you get your, your debt to GDP uh, at 125% as it is now. I think we've taken that, that, that ratio down from about 135% last year to 125% this year, and it's blown up a lot of things in the process. It's hurt the stock market doing that. It has uh, caused tremendous inflationary pressures. This is one reason a lot of grocery shelves uh, are empty, etc. And so these things have real-term effects. Uh, but I think that the odds of us getting anywhere close to 3% Fed funds, highly, highly unlikely. Uh, especially given the fact that we weren't able uh, to get up there. Uh, we weren't able to get up there uh, last time. Uh, last time we only got up to, uh, in, in June of 2019, we didn't even get up to 2.5% and things rapidly 
uh, rapidly slowed down. Right now, the debt levels are so much higher that it's going to be even more difficult. So expect continued volatility, uh, but Bitcoin still remains my, my asset of choice because money printing is the only way out. At some point in the next couple of months, probably the Fed is going to call uncle and uh, it's going to cry uncle and start printing money again. And then we'll have a massive reversal in stocks and in Bitcoin as well. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.